The B-Sides DC 2016 videos are brought to you by clearjobs.net and cybersecjobs.com, tools for your next career move, and Antietam Technologies, focusing on advanced cyber detection, analysis, and mitigation. We're going to give you a little talk about some, some basic Yara. Uh, this is the Yaya talk, yet another Yara elocution. And uh, my name is John Laycock. Uh, my co-presenter is Monty St. John. And uh, go ahead and uh, flick it over here. <clears throat> so this is my background. I've been doing computer forensics for the uh, better part of a decade now. Previous to that, I did video forensics. Uh, I've worked commercial, private sector, uh, government, uh, a little bit of everything. Currently, I'm on the uh, Fidelis threat research team uh, doing systems work, building giant systems of uh, threat research, basically. Uh, Monty? Can you guys hear me? Do I need the mic? Am I loud enough for the folks in the back? We're good? All right, so you can't see my face, but luckily you can see me up here. So I've been doing this for a while, a couple decades, a couple decades in uniform. You know, I've been lucky in the last 10 years, I've been a part of a lot of really cool incident response and threat research teams. It's kind of given me a lot of good perspective, especially with Yara, and hopefully we can share some of that with you today. Okay. All right, so I know we're get, getting started a few minutes late here, but would like to give you a bit of a disclaimer. This is an introductory, introductory level talk. If you use YAR in your day-to-day -day workflow, it's probably not the talk for you. Um, if you want to walk out and check out one of the other talks right now, you're not going to hurt my feelings. Uh, but I do like to frame expectations so that um, you know what we're going to do. So, um, so what is YARA? YARA is basically a tool that allows threat analysts and malware analysts to identify and classify different malware samples. Uh, it can be used to dissect files, look for patterns inside of files, uh, perform heuristic tests, and it, it can also help you to look through a file and see if there's parts of that file that are missing that you're expecting it to be there. Um, I know, you know, Monty, you had a note here. One of the things, too, is people kind of get caught up in using, you know, looking at files with this. You can also look through memory, okay? And we'll talk about, again, this is very, a very high-level talk, but we're going to talk about a lot of these, these types of things and give you some of the, some of the basics about Yara rules. Uh, did you have some stuff? Yeah, I was going to add on to that. You know, so we mentioned threat researchers and malware researchers. It's a little more than that. You can use Yara. Anybody can actually use Yara. You can use it for just about anything. If it's a file or has structure, you can pretty much point Yara at it and look for things. And the interesting thing about Yara is you look at files in, in, a, in a bunch of different ways. You can look at the way it is in the wild. You can look at the way it is when it's unarmored, unwrapped, unprotected. And you can also look for the inverse of what you think should be there and look for the things that are missing, kind of what we talked about. We're going to touch on those a little bit, but if you have more questions about it, you can definitely hit us afterwards. We'll go into more detail. Okay. So, start at the beginning. Um, so, we, you know, if we want to write a YAR rule, um, we need to start with a rule name. So, there's, uh, you'll see we have some tables in here. Uh, one of the things we've done with this deck is we've actually got a references section in the back with a lot of links to a lot of different uh, online resources that we use to help us write this, but also, you know, just things that we use for reference on a regular basis. So, starting with the rule name, uh, which is one of the keywords, uh, next slide you'll see we have a table of, of some of the YAR keywords, um, and then it's followed by the actual rule name, or the identifier. Uh, just a couple of notes with that. The first character of a rule name cannot be a digit, okay? Uh, rule names are case sensitive. They can't be longer than 128 characters. Um, kind of goes without saying, if your rule name is is really that long, you're probably getting a little too specific. Um, usually I try to keep it to about maybe two or three words and I usually will put a, uh, an underscore in between the different words. So, you know, uh, John's underscore rule, underscore malware, underscore sample or something like that. You can get crazy with it. It's really kind of like anything. It's just up to your, your personal preferences. Um, <clears throat> and you'll see at the very bottom of the slide there, there's a little curly bracket. That's where the actual content of the rule will, um, will start. Uh, go ahead and go to the next slide there. I was going to make a quick note. I mean, it makes sense that you would use rule names that actually make sense. They speak to the content or they speak to your perspective of what you're trying to write the rule for. You know, make sure and employ that when you're naming it. Don't name it something nonsensical. A lot of times the output, which you'll see later, we'll give a couple snapshots. The output is often the rule name itself. So make it make sense to what you're looking for. You know, you can either output that or its other elements, which I'm not going to get ahead of myself. So yeah. I'll let you talk. 
no problem. Um, you'll see we have this table in here a couple times. This is just to point out that these are reserved keywords. Um, when you name your rule, you don't want to call it rule and then like all or uh, no case or them or, or that kind of a thing. Um, but you could do, you know, rule underscore all or, or something along those lines if you wanted to use some of these words inside of your rule name itself. Just don't call it all and or any, that kind of thing. <clears throat> so the next section, and this is an optional section, um, but it, it's very useful. It's the metadata section. And this allows you to put some different information inside of the, uh, the rule content itself uh, so that you can kind of use it to classify if you have a particular family of malware you're looking for or, or things like that or if you just want to, you know, if you have a team working on it, you can put author names. And you can see I have a very basic, you know, description, author, nickname. Um, does anybody here know who Emil Verbin is? Just out of curiosity. Okay, I didn't think so. <laughs> Old-time baseball player from the 40s, so. Um, anyhow, uh, that's, that's the meta section. You can use it a lot to do a lot of classification. And Monty, I think you're going to talk about that a little bit further down, but um, just kind of keep in mind, it, this is an optional section here. Um, and, the, and the reason why you want to use the metadata, again, you know, it's, as your number of rules increase, this is going to help you to kind of categorize and sort them. Uh, it allows you to describe what's in them because six months later you're not going to remember what you put in there most likely. Um, and it, it just helps you to ID it in case you want to do a you know quick grep. They're, they're text files, so you can do a quick grep to look for um, some information for you know you may not have remember the rule name itself, but the metadata may tag it for you. And um, and you had the metrics section. I don't remember what exactly you were thinking there with the metrics for the directive stuff. So it's. It like anything, you can count it, you can look at statistics for it, you can gather how often it's firing, how often it's not firing, and a million other different possibilities with metrics. If you work for anybody at a company, they ask you for metrics at some point. And so you need to build that in if you're thinking ahead a little bit when you're writing your YAR rules so that you don't have to go back and do it after the fact. Okay. So now this is really the, um, the main portion of the rule itself. This is where uh, most of your, 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 your action happens, so to speak. So you've got the rule name, and then you'll see that there's two sections. These are the required sections of a YARA rule. They are the st strings and the condition section. And <clears throat> you'll see for the, the strings, we actually have two strings declared in there. Uh, we have the my text string, which is play ball, and then the my hex string, which also spells out baseball. And then we have the condition, a very simple condition. Uh, if either one of these strings occurs in the sample, we'll get a match on this. Okay, so very basic layout. This is just to really show you the two different sections. So with the string section, when you declare a string, you start with the identifier of a dollar sign, and then you can use a sequence of alphanumeric numbers and characters and underscores and all that kind of stuff. <clears throat> Um, and strings can be defined in a number of different ways. You can do ASCII strings, Unicode. Um, you, know, why, uh, you can see right there we have the Unicode with the wide keyword. Um, so you can do a lot of different types of strings as you're going along. And again, just to point out the table there, you can see we've got, oh, no case. Um, uh, a couple other wide, yeah. A couple of different keywords that you can employ to look at different pieces of content. Yeah, it, you know, it's, again, it's just what, what you're working with really here. So go ahead and click over to the next one here. So one of the things you can do is use the full word uh, string, and that allows you to look for word boundaries. So if you're looking for a very specific word, um, you would, you would want to use full word. So in case here, if we had the example of baseball, um, if you define it as full word, it won't match on one baseball.com, uh, but it would match on... Um, baseball-reference.com and baseball.com because they're separated by the period and the, the dash, okay? But, if, you know, you can see with the one baseball, because they had the word in front of it, that would not match on that. Okay, okay so hex strings we can get, start to get a little bit more detailed with. Uh, you can see they're enclosed by the curly brackets. Um, it should go without saying the decibel numbers are not allowed in hex strings. Uh, you can see we have the hex string of baseball 23. So <clears throat> um, we can also allow uh, for wild cards and jumps and uh, different alternatives. A wild card character is a question mark. And you can see uh, that the second string down there has the BA uh, 
wildcard, BA wildcard 1123. So that would match on you know, anything with those, with those wild cards in it. You can also uh, get into variable content and length. Um, in this case here, you can see we've got some jumps to find in there where the, uh, um, in the middle there where it has the 2-4, it allows us to look for variable number of characters in there from two to four. Um, they're unbounded, so you can uh, put a jump at the beginning or at the end. Um, and uh, Monty, did you have a note there? I see you have a thing there. Yeah, just a note. If you use these, if you use jumps or use even um, well, particular jumps, Yara is pretty forgiving on a lot of things, but it will really yell at you if you try to put these at the beginning or the end. And I've seen people try it. That, that's a horrible idea. I mean, use different logic. You know, use it in the center. It needs something to search for to find that content to be able to jump around. So use common sense when you're putting these together. Yeah. And you'll see that come up, that, that'll come into play a little bit later when we start talking about the next uh, section here. Um, one other thing that we can do, we can actually get in there and do some pipe commands. So you can see the example here for the hex string. We have uh, BA, 5E, BA. Then we also have uh, with the pipe separating the two. Basically, that's like an OR. So it's either 5E, BA, or 5E, BB. And you can see that it would match on either one of those, those particular hex strings there. Now, the, um, the other thing that you can do is you can actually define regexes uh, within your um, <clears throat> your strings. And these, um, you know, I have, a, I have one coworker that really loves his regexes. He puts together these really long, intricate strings. And kind of like Monty was hinting at before uh, with the jumps, you know, that sometimes comes at a cost. So you know, I'm, I'm more of the mindset of simplicity when I try to do these things. Not always the case. You know, sometimes these things get very complex. And you know who I'm talking about, don't you? <laughs> Um, and you can see in this particular case here, we have um, a string for an MD5 and uh, just a very basic uh, type of regex, 0, 9, A through F, A through F, 32 characters, that kind of thing. So that would match on an, an MD5 value. Just wanted to make a quick note. Even though we went through a couple of slides, I mean, really it boils down to string, hex, or a regex. Now, there are variations to each one of those. Like, you could look for Unicode strings, you could look for ASCII strings, you could look for a combination. You can get into regexes all day long, complicated or simple. And then, of course, you can look at hex and any of its ability to either you know, substitute in or have jumps. So you have to keep that in mind when you're developing a rule on what you want to look at content-wise or what you want to detect and not find. So part of that we'll talk about and touch on, but at this basic level, just remember, you really have three options there. And then that'll play into conditions. Yeah, and, and it really gets down to, the, I mean, there's more than one way to do things. And so sometimes, you know, you, you kind of start going down a road because you have it in your head you want to use a regex, and maybe you just need to back up and maybe just use a very simple hex. Um, just like anything, you know, it, it, it's just a matter. You just don't want to paint yourself into a corner, and you can, take, you can have some really big performance hits when you do that. So the... Uh, the other, uh, the other necessary section we have, in addition to strings, are the conditions. And so you can see here we have the um, very simple condition of my text string or my hex string. Okay? And then we can start to get a little bit more complicated from there. You can use a lot of your common booleans, you know, your ands and ors, etc. Um, <clears throat> and you can see here we can start, we're starting to add a little bit more complexity. Um, and this, the, f the first bullet there, you can see we've got a counting example. So if the my text string occurs three times, or the my hex string occurs less than or equal to seven, and the RE uh, is greater than or equal to two, um, then it'll be a match, basically. Um, and when you're doing a counting operation, you're going to use the pound sign there for the, uh, the identifier. And, um, you know, you can start to to really develop some complexity with that. Um, you can also use other rule names. So as you build a corpus of rules, uh, you can come in and, ref you know, you can see in the condition here we're referencing the ghost dash rule and my hex string. And anytime you reference a rule, it has to have been processed before you actually reference it. So if I put it down underneath my condition, it's not going not gonna to see it. All right, so the conditions also, just like with the hex strings and the, the text strings, and you know, just the different strings, we can start to add some more complexity, like I said. You can see we've got a very basic set of strings here. 
string A, uh, Chicago, string B, Cubs, string C, baseball. Um, in this case, we're looking for two of those three. So if my, uh, my sample has two of those three, it's going to fire a match on that. And again, you can, you know, one of the things you may want to do, I think we've got it referenced at the end of the deck, but the YARA documentation online has a plethora of different examples that you can use. Um, this was just one I thought was kind of, I, I've seen this one used quite a bit, and it's a pretty useful one. And one kind of other thing to kind of mention here is you can actually use include files, just like a lot of different languages that are out there. Um, in this case, uh, you can see we're closing it with the quotes, so you can do an include other dot yard to include another rule. And okay. I'm starting to get carpal tunnel with that. Um, so the, you know, just 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 like with anything, you know, the base path, uh, you can do absolute, you can do relative paths, and you can really start to, uh, you know get as, as, as specific as you need to. So we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about this when Monty starts to get into some of the categorization and some of the monolithic and megalithic and all those other structures. But um, at this point, um, I'd like to take just a quick minute. Are there any questions so far? Just a couple of them. If you haven't, we'll answer a couple real quick before we move into a bit more. Bueller? Bueller? OK. okay. All right. Here you go, Mike. Yeah, I'm just going to talk. As long as you can hear me, I'm good. If you can't, let me know. Well, it'll probably be better for the, uh, the video. All right. I like to bellow out. You know, this just kind of gets annoying. All right. So he, John mentioned the include directive a little bit ago. So rule organization is really key, especially as you grow in your rules. So when you first start, you create a couple of rules. It's not a big deal. You create a couple hundred, it starts becoming kind of a burden. Start creating a couple thousand, and then it really starts to change. You start losing track of what you wrote, when you wrote it, and what you wrote it for. Metadata may help, but having some organization to things really helps play towards keeping track and understanding why you're using a rule or not using one. So I've got a quick kind of snapshot here in a minute, but with the include directive, its strength is that you can create rules and put them in separate files and then add and subtract them as you need. So no one uses all the rules all the time. If they do, they're probably wasting some of their precious uh, processing time when they're doing so. If you organize it and put things in groups, just like you would classify and organize against different pieces of malware or different files, it will help you out in the long run. And I, I clicked on the next slide, I've got an example, which you can't hardly see. I got the same problem you did, Andrew, yesterday. So this is supposed to show a snapshot. It's talking about a threat group called Kudosu, and it, it just breaks down how I've started splitting out different, direct, you know, different files with, that have been pulled in with the include directive. So it's kind of hard to see, but there's the main rule in the middle, and then off to the side where you see that first large bracket on the right, that's a separate rule just for that threat group that has in it a subset of about 15 rules that I'm going to look each time. Now underneath that, there are other ones for different events, for the Forbes event where you know, the Forbes breach happened, and then a second one for the Samsung pay breach, and so on. Everything that's associated with that threat actor that I'm interested in, and I want to see when I run it against files if I match on them. With the metadata, as we talked about earlier, you organize your metadata so that when it fires off and you look at your results, it not only tells you what it is and where it is and why you did it, but also tells you what directive, what file it's sitting in, which helps when you have thousands of rules. Next slide. So I, I, this whole next couple of slides is all about rule organization and rule order. The order of rules is also important. A lot of people create one gigantic monolithic file and they throw all the rules in it and they don't really care what order they fire off. Other than I, hey, if I'm going to reference this, I want to make sure that I've, pre, you know, I've previously defined it. But sometimes you want to know in what order some rules have fired off. You may have slight changes to 50 different rules and you're looking for tiny variations. You can create kind of complicated condition lines or you can actually separate them into different rules and then watch when they fire off. So it can be very interesting to play with that. And we have a little example here later. Oh, go back, go back, go back. Uh, the other thing is there are different types of rules. We didn't touch on this earlier, but there are rules that you write, and then there are private rules that you want to match or not match, but not really uh, report back to you. You just want to use them for as an inclusion in a different rule. And you also have global rules, which you want to apply to everything in your rule file. So in this case, if you only want to look at PE files, you may define a global rule that says, hey, only look at PE files. You know, this rule, as long as it matches on PE file, it's going to match against everything else that you have included. So all global rules will get processed first. And a lot of those we use for things like PE files or file size. So you only want to look at, in this run, 
anything under two megabytes. Great. Define it in a global rule so you don't have to define it in each individual rule. So the concept of the global rule is define it once and it's going to apply to everything. Private rules, you define something you want to match on and then you're going to use it later, but you don't want it to report back. A lot of times you do that for heuristics. You may only be interested in some files that only have particular sections or only have particular interesting strings. It's really useful if you're doing ingram matching with your ER so that you can match on certain ingrams and look for that in combination. But you really don't care if it just matched by itself. It's kind of a strategy to go with your rules. And the next one, uh, you can do some rudimentary uh, if-then logic with rules. And I, I really want to mention this. A lot of times people also run Yara once. They try to shove everything in one big file and run Yara once and they want to then process the results. It's, it's often more optimal to split up your runs and run it multiple times for different reasons. Hence back to your include directive. Run it once, get initial results, run it again. You know, if we did this manually, you would run one, see what you needed, change your, your includes, and then run that separate set and continue to hone and find out what you're looking for. It's really good if you have unknown files to run that kind of strategy, because then you can parse things out and check and then refine that and then run it again and further get down to finding out what you have in your hands. So just you can use it with AND logic, any of the Boolean logic. I kind of broke it out on the next slide a little bit where you can't really see either. But in this one, I, I, I defined a couple of private rules at the top. You know, is this a PE file? Does it have different PE sections? You know, there's roughly 8 to 12 regular sections you expect to see, and there's some oddball sections that show up for different reasons. This rule would match on that. And then more different CIDR ranges and things that I'm interested in. And then I'm just going down different rules. Again, you can't really see it, but uh, Process, it's, there. it's there. The idea is the one that's got the bracket first next to it at the top is about interesting strings that I'm looking for. I don't care which one of those matches, but I want it to match with a PE file and one that has an oddball PE structure. And the same thing for the second one. It does something similar except with a CIDR range. I'm looking for IP addresses embedded in a file in a certain range. So just an idea how you might reorganize your, your rule files to fire off in a certain order and in a certain way. Next one. This one is just an example of and not. It's the same thing as before. And here's another snapshot of rule organization. You know, again, same kind of things. Private rules at the top. You know, this uh, is PE, different PE sections, that kind of thing. And then going down the floor, and you can't see it, which really, anyway. It, it looks at things, and it says, hey, I want to find certain, rule, I want certain rules to fire. I want certain things to match inside the core rule, but I want other things not to match. And so you can kind of get a combination going. Go ahead. So um, just a side note, uh, after the talk, I will upload this up on SlideShare and post it out so um, you'll be able to see much better what we're talking about up here. And also from the, the references link I mentioned earlier, you'll be able to see all those different links. I'm not expecting you guys to write this stuff down. This is just, these are talking points for us. So um, anyways, Monty. Yeah, that's fine. Go ahead. We'll give you some snapshots of what it looks like. I mean, YAR itself is not pretty. It's not meant to be. It's very simple, very very good structure. This is just a snapshot of what it looks like at the command line. You'll notice there's a lot of different switches, and this is actually visible, thankfully, where you can run different things. You can have it return the rule name with uh, the right switch. You can have it return just the metadata with the right switch. And you might want to do that in tandem. You might want to do that on different runs. I mean, you'll have to figure out a good strategy in which to use it. And this next one is just a snapshot of it matching on different rules. So from our previous example, I ran a file against it, uh, recovery.back, and I ran my main rule file with a lot of include directives to see what would match on it. And it came back with a variety of things. In this case, a couple zero-day matches and a couple other items that you know, I would then follow up with and find interesting and pursue with uh, whatever rule strategy I'm using. Okay, and keep in mind too, obviously these are Windows boxes. Uh, YAR will run on multiple platforms, Linux, Mac, Windows, etc. Um, just I think, Monty, you just had a Windows box handy when you did these screenshots. Lowest yeah, lowest, lowest common denominator. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay. So um, there are a lot of resources out there, uh, you know, to kind of help you get started. Um, if you if you've been doing it for a while, or if, if you're just getting started, um, if you're just getting started. Yargen is kind of a nice tool. Um, I used this one uh, a couple years ago when I did my first rule. Uh, it's written by Florian Roth. Who uh, he he's also got a number of uh, great references up on uh, GitHub, and uh, pretty active in the community. Um, so what does Yargen do? It, it allows you to just create some basic uh, YAR rules from strings in an automated fashion, 
and it will use some Bayesian classifiers to help you um, classify the string to detect useful words and it will extract, also can extract opcode elements from the dot text section of a PE file. Um, where I used this actually was to help me identify some strings and you know it returned a giant list of different strings that were available to me and I ran it across several samples and that allowed me to find um, you know, in this case, I think I was looking at CryptoLocker uh, version 1. It allowed me to find a bunch of common strings between the different samples to create one good solid master rule. Um, and I was looking for fairly unique strings. I think in this case, there were some file paths that started like with Z, you know, colon. It was some project directory that they had. So I, that was one of them that I used. And I, I can't remember. It's been a while now since I've done it. But there were a number you know, of, of fairly unique strings. I tried to grab probably about five or six of them. Uh, to throw in there. And um, there's also, binarily, I think you had some comments on that one, Monty. Just a couple of comments on Yargin. If you're like most SOCs or incident, you know, folks in incident response teams, you don't have a lot of time, Yargin can save you a lot of effort and give you a good starting point. So if you only have so much time to craft rules and you have to look at 100, 200, 500,000 files, you can run Yargin against all of them and get a good starting point with the R rule to match. It looks at things individually and it will also be grouping and it will give you a group rule where it can. So if yeah. you speed it a couple hundred files, it will spit out individual rules as well as rules for each group that it can find. Right. Which can be useful, again, if you have a time. It can be useful, but yeah, it, it can also create some noise, right? It you can know. create some noise. Yeah. It's good to do like a check, so you may craft your own rule and if you have enough time, run that as well. And look at the differences between the two, because its selection logic is pretty good yeah. and it's constantly being tuned. So it can be a good uh, quality check for something you've written or a starting point if you have a lack of time and you need to actually generate rules quickly. Yeah. And, and you'll see in the notes on this slide, I actually have the two links for Yargen and for Binarly. Um, they're also at the end of the deck, but you know, as you go through, definitely, you know, we do have some real basic crude notes in the, in the, um, uh, the presentation, but just something to keep in mind. Did I talk about Binarly? Um, yeah, go ahead. No. Binarily is kind of a new add-in. It, it, it's a tool you can use to search for chunks of code that you can pull out of files. It can be useful to figure out what, what that actually is referring to and also to determine if that's a good match or not. It's especially useful if you're creating rules just for memory or if you're just looking at something you want to be very selective and you're only looking for certain algorithms within files. Great thing to use to try to figure that out. If you haven't toyed with it, it's free. You can get on there and register. They'll send you an API key that you can use and leverage. Okay, so um, another great resource. Uh, this is a invitation-only group. It's called the Yara Exchange. Um, is there anybody here that's a member, just out of curiosity? Just you guys? Okay. Um, great resource. Uh, you, you see the uh, contact link there. You can contact them. Um, they will check you out and all that kind of good stuff. Um, and it's actually a really good forum. They do some meetups at, uh, it's a Black Hat or DEF CON? Black Hat. Black Hat, okay. Great. I heard, I heard. I don't do Vegas, so. Um, but uh, anyways, the, uh, the Yark Exchange, a lot of great information, a lot of people really trying, to, just like with B-Side, just a lot of people trying to help each other out and uh, really good uh, good form. I know they had, is, is the Slack thing still going or is it, yeah, okay. So there's kind of a blend of the email group and, and, the, and the Slack group as well, so. They're extremely active. <clears throat> yeah, every day. Submit rules to participate. Just right. Yeah, this is not a not a passive group. You know, if you if you want to be involved with it, they want you contributing. They don't want you just sitting there lurking in the background and and um, not participating. So, um, and in the shameless plug category, we do have some Yara rules up on uh, my company site, Fidelis. Um, it's actually hosted up at our Git. We have a GitHub um, <coughs> uh, page. Uh, we also have some some of our reports and things up there as well. So, um, just just some more things to kind of point out. And references. yes, references. So we've got about two or three slides. I know it's probably a little bit difficult to see the references uh, from here, but these are just some of the things we talked about here. So uh, you can see the uh, the uh, the YAR rules and YAR gen, etc. So I won't belabor that point. Um, Monty, did you have anything you wanted to add in here? Okay. All right. Um, at this point, we'll open up the floor to any questions, comments, uh, thoughts. Down with um, like a particular fan 
family of malware versus everything else so that you get more specific rules that narrow in on that family? Uh, I use the good and the bad together. I, I find that's the most effective for me. There are other folks that do different strategies, but that's the one that I found works best. Okay. Uh, any other questions? Question right here in front. It really depends on the, the corpus of rules that you have. Um, you know, you know your customers better than, than anyone else and the types of customers that you have. So if you're looking for, uh, you know, just kind of leading my background, we used to do a lot of large scale credit card breaches. So if I had a corpus of rules that were very specific towards that, I might do that very early if I have a, a really targeted set of data and just, just kind of have it running in the background. Um, you know, if, if you're, if you're fishing, you know, it's probably something that you want to do kind of later on if you're looking for, you know, some needles in the haystack. Okay. I think I... Oh. I was going to add on to that. So it, it kind of depends on what kind of investigation you're doing as well. If they have a lot of internet domains that you have to search, using uh, Yara with a web scanner could be useful, could be quick. Uh, if they have email issues and you have to go through gigs of email, Yara can help you process that really fast. There are other tools as well, but I mean, if you've already crafted them, and you're trying to respond and, and look through like 10 gigs of email, it can be a really good tool to do that and kick off and go do something else. And additionally, a lot of times after you put your hands on files, that's when you craft your ER, that's when you may use it to look across the network for other files. It just depends on what you use. Yeah, I mean, it's really just like keyword searching, right? You start out with a fairly vague set and then you start to refine it as you learn more about the, the incident response. Um, so it's not really just a run it here at this part of the investigation and then you know, it, it, it's, it's a continual process. Are there community rule sets? Yes. Yeah. There's some on the, the Yara Exchange site. Uh, I think Florian Roth has some up on his GitHub page. Um, and there, there's others out there as well. You just need to be careful using that. I and mean, you have to understand why they wrote it in the first place. Yeah. You didn't know if they wrote it against the sample that was in the wild or a sample that they already unwrapped and, and cleaned up and it's perfectly poised to match. Yeah. And oftentimes that's not what you're going to see. You're going to see how it is in the wild. It's probably armored in some fashion. And you won't get a match when you expect to, even though you have a perfectly good rule. It's just targeted at the wrong thing. Right. I mean, if the packers, encryption, you know, all that, all that fun stuff. Yeah. You know, you have to know where in the process they're using it, you know, to handle that. So I think I saw a hand over here. Yeah. Um, if you don't really care where the, like, if you're, you have a file, for instance, that you're looking through, and what you want to find out is, was there a DNS call, or did it try to do a DNS call? Is there a way to just see if they? Uh, try to make that call in the file rather yes. than actually having to have a, uh, like is there just an easy true statement being put in there? Of sorts. So there are modules that go with Yara and one of them is the Cuckoo module and you can run it to look for if it would do a DNS call out. Absolutely. And get matching that way. Yeah, so okay. If you go to the Yara.read the docs, it's going to talk about all the different modules as well. There are a variety of them. It was kind of beyond what we wanted to touch on here. But you can do, I mean, there's a math module, there's a cuckoo module, there's a P module. There's a lot of extra modules that add other functionality where you can look for probably everything you're looking for, especially when it comes to the uh, to DNS. A lot of different calls can be tracked without having to go through the process of letting it talk out. Yeah, and, and I can remember having set up Cuckoo a couple years ago. That was actually where I got introduced to Yara. So I can remember, you know, through the Cuckoo docs that they talked about, you know, installing Yara and, and setting up your rules in there as well as part of the, the Cuckoo process, so... Okay. Anybody else? Uh, um, so other than dynamic analysis with Google and maybe grabbing stuff out of memory, is there any sort of static analysis unpacker to like to run your samples through um, before you start applying the narrow sign signatures? You know, there is the PEID uh, module. Um, it's fairly de uh, dated at this point. Um, uh, Right. I mean, but that, I mean, that's kind of the first step, obviously. So, um, you know, it would just be the normal, you know, using whatever tools, you know, you would want to go in and, and decrypt your file or unpack it and, and starting from there. So, um, you know, it's really just a literal, you know, search when you go through. So, I mean, use your in a lot of ways. You could use your to detect different types of hackers like that and then take, take action from that point. Are you looking for a tool that will actually help you unpack? Yeah. Okay. We can talk afterwards. That'd probably be better for this. Okay. So we can stay focused on Yara. But that, that's kind of, with Yara, there's the things you do beforehand, and then there's things you do after, and this is one of those things you do beforehand before you actually get into writing a rule. But if, if you unpack first, you can apply Yara signatures that 
you know, might be useful and get you good intelligence. Yes. Mm -hmm. That's why I was saying in the wild, it's probably packed, armored up, you know, obfuscated, all that other stuff. You might want to write a yard rule just for that, and then write a separate one for when it's not. Right. Generally, we write both, so you can match it when it's out in the wild somewhere. It's going to be look different from after you've unpacked it and cleaned it up. And then you want to want you, know, you might want to match on that, which might be more representative of memory or not. It just depends on how it presents itself. Everyone's a little different. Okay. Uh, there was another question over here. Uh, I mean, I mean, there's a lot of products out there. I mean, my, yeah, shameless plug. My company has it integrated within our our product. Um, I, I believe that the the Yara page itself has a list of of companies that are using it in commercial products, um, and I'm sure there's obviously going to be a lot of open source stuff out there as well. So it's it's gained a lot of momentum over the last couple of years. So it's uh, it's a pretty common tool for for the malware analyst to uh, and threat analyst to use. It's, it's integrated in a lot of different tools. I mean, from the ones you mentioned, FireEye has it, but they have a very, very early, early version. Yeah. Uh, OWASP Web Scanner uses it. I mean, there's a lot of yeah. tools that do. There's a couple off the top of my head. Yeah, yeah. And you know, and it's, it's like, Py you know, we, we had talked about this the other day. It's like Python. I mean, you know, there's, you know, people that write their Python scripts for 2.7 or 3.0. The same thing with the different versions of Yara that are out there. And uh, they have different um, use, uh, not use cases, but just different, quirks that go along with them. So the older versions may use the uh, PCRE engine for regexes, and you know the newer versions use, what, what was it again? It's, I, I've been using the, yeah, it's, it's, so there's different syntaxes with the regexes, and so there's, depending on the version of YAR that you're using, you have different considerations as, as you, you write your rules. Go ahead. So, yes, there, there's a couple ways to use YAR. One is to do exact match. You want to match exactly this perfect scenario. The ones that only match in part, they're more heuristic in nature. Those are the best ones to share because they're wider, they're more flexible. Now, I don't know if you're referring to like file system or just variety of files possible. I mean, what, what's your intent with the rule you want to rule, you want to write and share? I mean, if I see this malware sample in my environment, I'd like to be able, or other, other folks, to be able to just detect detect it as well. Um, and I mean, you've talked about whether it's been seen in the wild or mm -hmm. if you've done analysis and unpacked it, um, how you can let somebody know that, like the scenario that you should be applying this rule. Metadata section would be, yeah. Metadata is a good place to, to pass in information on. I would definitely pass a rule that was more oriented towards something that would be seen in the wild than something that's already cleaned up and unpacked because that's more likely what someone's initially going to run into and what they're going to detect first. Now, if you're, you're sharing with other researchers, you're part of a research company, it could be different. You know, I might share with, you know, folks I know that have that capability already, a rule that's more oriented towards matching on the impact version. It depends on what the scenario is. Really, it's kind of varied. But generally speaking, I would go for the in the wild version of any rule you write, and then really explain why you're matching on it. You might match on script, for example, and you're looking, using the web scanner to scan different sites. You've got to be careful with what you share, because it can be seen in a couple different ways. Does that answer your question, I guess? Yeah. Yeah. The one other metadata field that I see a lot is like a hash value that I find helpful that I yeah. wrote this for this hash. And yeah. That if you have virus total access, then somebody else can pull it. Yeah. Down. And if you have virus total access and you have their intelligence, you can obviously host your rules there and do some hunting. Which, if you don't have access, it's an awesome thing to have. You've never used it, but you should take a look at it. It's well worth your time. It's expensive, though, but it's worth it. Yeah. So, any more questions? Okay. Uh, if you would like to come up, we'll be kind of loitering up front here for a few minutes. So, I think we've got about a couple more minutes here in the room. So, if you want to come on up and, and ask some questions one on one, we'd be happy to, to sit and talk with you guys. And thank you guys very much for coming. And go Cubs! <laughs>